All right, before we get started today, be honest. How many of you watched that GTA 6 trailer yesterday? No, I did too. I did too. Your teacher is cool. A lot of butts though, huh? The 2023 Game Awards happened last week and it featured many game trailers and some awards, but it was a lot of trailers. If you watched from the pre-show all the way to when Jeff waved goodbye, you saw new stuff from over 40 different video games. That's so many. And Game Awards viewership is larger than ever. Essentially, this is the largest live audience you could ask for to show off your video game. Which is great, but also at the same time, because there are so many trailers packed into this thing back to back to back, the real challenge becomes standing out. And I'm not saying every game needs to steal the show, but the primary goal of any video game trailer should be to be memorable. At the very least, you want your trailer to be a you know the one with. Meaning that you could talk to somebody else, you could say you know the one with, and they'll know exactly what you're talking about. A lot of games struggle with just that. They struggle to give you a character or a moment or a concept that your brain can mentally grasp onto. And sorry for calling out that one particular game. I think there were a lot of games that we all forgot we saw at the Game Awards last week. But here I am one week after that evening, and the ones that are sticking out to me are... Yeah, one, the OD trailer. You know, the one with the giant actor faces eerily reciting a creepy tongue twister. Which, I yeah, I admit is not a good video game trailer. But it made an impact. It maybe left a scar. I'm not going to forget that trailer. And then the other one that I can't stop thinking about is, you know, the one with Sega revealing five remakes. If you missed this one, it opens with two old Zoomers, potentially platonic competitive roommates. Their Sega memorabilia implodes, their power goes out, and then five new remakes, early development footage subject to change, are rapidly breezed through. You got Jet Set Radio, Shinobi, Golden Axe, Streets of Rage, Crazy Taxi, and more, now in development. Power the next level? Sega. But while the visual reveals of these projects was a big surprise for the most part, uh, the existence of these projects should not have been. Sega has been telling investors that these things were coming since 2021. And that is why this is the week that I learned that I love Sega financial reports. Welcome, dear audience, to a paradise of Sega information. I mean, look at this. You know I love a four-quadrant chart. Just a reminder, though, for the context of these things, this is a document created for potential and current investors of Sega Sammy. So, you know, just part of this is about video games. Usually, like, 40% is dedicated to pachi slot stuff, sometimes resort business. So it's investor-focused PR, which I think is what makes this interesting. So back to the chart. Our two axes represent profitability and growth potential. High profitability and high growth potential are Sega's main five IPs. Sonic, Fantasy Star Online, Like a Dragon, Persona, and Total War. These are Sega's five favorite money makers, and you'll see them grouped up together all the time. On the low growth side, we see domestic mobile games and amusement machines. Look, it's good money, but it's not a growing market. So here's the good stuff. Low profitability, high growth potential. Plan two, creation of super game. That's like some legendary 90s era, mysterious, you wanna know more kind of branding. Did you hear? Sega's working on a super game. My God, I gotta know more. We'll t and I do want to talk about the super game. We'll save that for later. And you'll also see in this quadrant, we have expansion of past IP libraries, which is the relevant thing. But also if you're curious, the low profitability, low growth potential quadrant is empty. That's presumably where hyenas ended up. The next page shows a very funny line chart. It's Sega's projected growth loosely. There are no numbers here, we're just illustrating our intent. The main five IPs are going to continue to grow. The old IPs are just going to be this pretty solid kind of green bar. Not a ton of money, but you know, just, it's always going to be there for us. And then look how much the super game business is projected to explode. 
And what's funny is they've used this chart three years in a row, changing it slightly. Strangely, this year, super game earnings were cleaved by a new bluish-gray wedge for strengthening development resources. I'm not sure what that means. But next year, you can't say three years anymore, okay, Sega? It's time to give me a new chart, please. But why are we here in the first place? We're asking for that clarification on the IP utilization. Here it is, as stated in 2021, they're all there. Crazy Taxi, Jet Set Radio, everything except for Golden Axe. Golden Axe, you know, not a, not a classic. It's not a classic. But what are we going to do with these? Remaster? Remake? Reboot. So what happened at the Game Awards this year totally makes sense. This is just part of Sega's plan from way back in 2021. Here it is. Come to fruition. Let's ride this little Emerald Escalator up into the future. But this next page is so funny. Look at this mess. When Capcom does this, it looks like this. You look at something like this and you think, oh my god, they really are the best. You look at this Sega image and you think, what is this? Who is this little girl who fell over? Don't even tell me who this is. I don't want to know who this one is. I can tell you, it is not a valuable IP. <laughs> and so when Gamatsu points out that Sega has also just locked in its trademarks for Altered Beast, Eternal Champions, and Kid Chameleon, I'm not given confidence that this company understands which of its IP is actually good. It's like if Disney is making a Disney Plus ad and they're like, you can have access to all of our animated classics, like Beauty and the Beast, Chicken Little, Aladdin, Home on the Range, The Lion King, Goofy slams down a hot plate of dog food. Subscribe today. Do you even know? Do you know which one is which? Sega, and I realize it's probably not my place to assume that this historic video game publisher might be out of touch with its own success but just read this with me. This is a funny graphic that attempts to explain Sonic's turnaround in popularity, which apparently started in 2010. Our social media strategy involved posting not only game information, but also content for sparking conversations among Sonic fans and encouraging them to share. This is of course referencing Sonic's stint as a successful Twitter influencer. This attracted the younger generation of fans, helping build a new community of fans. Out of this community was born Sonic Mania, which made use of a groundbreaking method of building a game while communicating with fans. What are you talking about? That's the Sonic Mania takeaway? You think that was the turning point? And while that is perplexing, nothing confuses and excites me more than the prospect of the super game. Now what is a super game? Here's how Haruki Satomi, the president and group CEO and representative director of Sega Sammy Holdings Inc. described it in 2022. The ultimate goal in the super game strategy is to create a game so revolutionary that it attracts far more active users than any of the group's games to date. One key to achieving this goal is whether we can draw together a large community involving not only players, but also streamers who stream the game and viewers who watch their videos. That kind of community expands and further develops game content, adding value to the game that is unimagined by the developers and sparking a broader movement, which can then draw in even more users and grow the game's presence dramatically. If we can set off this kind of virtuous cycle, I believe reaching target lifetime sales for the super game of 100 billion yen is entirely feasible. Entirely feasible? <laughs> In the 2023 report, we got some new information from Shuji Utsumi, who's the co-COO, director of the board, Sega Corporation. So as the name implies, a super game involves the concept of a game that stands head and shoulders above normal games. I encourage stakeholders to look forward to the fruit of our efforts, which include R&D to create a game that builds a whole worldview involving the entire gaming ecosystem, including not only players, 
but also streamers who stream the game and their viewers. They want Fortnite. Sega believes they can develop a Fortnite. And I think it is entirely feasible that they will fail miserably. And if you haven't been keeping track of that particular super game, Fortnite did in fact add three whole new games this last week. A music rhythm game, a racing game, and a Lego survival game. And the secret is, what I'm willing to tell you right now on camera is that none of those games are actually that good. None of them are fun, fully featured games. All of them have better alternatives out there for you to play. I mean, I mean, there's a Lego Minecraft clone already. It's called Lego Worlds. It's a full game. But the reason why we're playing Lego Fortnite and not Lego Worlds is that these games are all tied into Fortnite. They have shared XP and some shared costumes and some shared dances. They're all part of the Fortnite ecosystem. Imagine being Sega right now and watching Epic masterfully execute your dream game, which won't be out for three to five more years. But I'm stuck on that question, right, of like Rocket League Racing. Is that a good game or is it good because of the ecosystem? And it actually does take me back to Sega and its value of its own IP. Because I think, okay, let's go back to the birth of Sega as a video game developer. They grew up in the arcades where you're surrounded by your competition, shoulder to shoulder. People have to look at your game and understand its concept and gameplay within seconds. And I think that's a skill and an attribute they excelled at. And I think that actually continued through their console games. And so when they're bringing up these IP, like Kid Chameleon and Altered Beast, I have to say, I don't think that was the, I don't think the IP was the strength of those video games. I think the strength of the brand was Sega. And I feel like they don't appreciate that. I feel like they don't understand that that they used to be insanely good at making video games, I should say especially good. Let's not say insanely, that's Nintendo. I think what we're seeing here when Sega says it's a new era is really just that they're trying to keep IP alive for the sake of IP so that when the Streets of Rage Netflix series comes out, we're compelled to watch that. And then when the Streets of Rage skins come out for Sega Fortnite, we're compelled to buy them. They believe they're better off making a kid chameleon game than something new and potentially interesting. However, I say all of that, and still in the bottom of my heart, I know that I want to see a super game by Sega. And uh, that's my problem. That's on me. And that is delayed input for this week. Thanks for watching. So we got some late night news, Thursday night news. Last of Us Online has been outright canceled. Obviously, this comes as a big surprise to me. Truthfully, despite Naughty Dog's perpetual enthusiasm to show me this game, I don't expect to ever see it. What I do find really interesting about this situation is the communication from Naughty Dog. While people who are looking forward to this game are rightfully disappointed and people who are working on this game for years are rightfully disappointed, Naughty Dog comes in not seeming apologetic, but relieved, particularly in this part. We had two paths in front of us. Become a solely live service game studio or continue to focus on single-player narrative games that have defined Naughty Dog's heritage. Well, if you put it that way. It's a good spin, right? It's like your parents saying like, hey, you can, you can have this candy bar or you can have this nice crispy apple that has defined our family's heritage. <laughs> but not too long ago, I did do a whole episode about The Last of Us Online and the troubles that was having. So there's not really too much more to say about that. There is one thing I've been dying to talk about this entire episode. This right here. Look, I know a lot of people are excited about a Shinobi 2D Sega game. Sure, be excited. I got a problem with this. This is some janky, janked up perspective. Just give it, just give it a little, you know what I mean? Just a little bump, just fix this. I don't like the way this, it looks, it looks like I'm looking at like a cow and chicken background. We have to have standards. We can't let this fly. We can't just be little nostalgia babies. They can't get away with this.